we are kicking off episode 434 of Monster Kid Radio with the song Operation Neptune. It's from the band The Catatonics. They're a pretty cool surf band based out of Bloomington, Indiana. Operation Neptune is also the name of the album, and you can find them at catatonics.bandcamp.com. Catatonics is spelled with a K. You can follow the link in the show notes over at monsterkidradio.net. When you're done listening to this episode of, well, Monster Kid Radio, my name's Derek M. Cook. Welcome to the show. This week, we are going back to the summer Monster Bash. We're going back to June. We're going back to Monster Bash 2019 because we've got another recording from that amazing convention for you. Gregory William Mank, he's a friend of the show. He's an incredible scholar, a great author. The guy knows his stuff, and he gave a presentation at this past Monster Bash all about the subject of one of his most recent books, The Actor, Laird Kragar. Laird Kragar was nominated for Raleigh Awards both this year and last year here on Monster Kid Radio. He's a severely underrated actor, and I'm excited to share this recording with you. I actually didn't even get to see the presentation myself at Monster Bash. I was at the Monster Kid Radio table pretty much the entire time. Thanks to Michael Ramsey, friend of the show, listener of the show, and just all-around great guy, Well, we now have this recording to share with you. And of course, Mr. Mink gave us permission to play this recording of his presentation here on the show. I hope you enjoy it. Also in this episode, of course, we've got some of the regular segments that we've come to know and love here. Professor Frenzy's Bedtime Stories, Kenny's Look at Famous Monsters of Filmland, and Dr. Tongue's World of Monster Collectibles. That's all coming up, too. I want to mention real quick at the top of the show, though, and I'll probably mention it again at the end of the show. If the intro and outro seem a little bit more compressed than normal, that's because it is super hot here in Portland, Oregon right now. We got into the upper 90s, and I don't want to keep the air conditioner off that long. So I'm going to try to do this short and sweet, get in and get out, and call it good. Before we go into the bulk of the show, start thinking about Twitch. I'll bring it up at the end. But if you have access to Twitch, that might be something you want to... uh, Well, stay tuned to hear about. Let's get into everything. Here we go, right now. Let's do it. (laughs) Welcome to an evening with Karloff, the master of menace in five fright-filled features. Watch breathlessly as the coffin opens to release... The Duck! <laughs> it's only a gal and bulls, the raven. Join Boris Karloff in the most gruesome day of the undead, Black Sabbath. Chilling delights. Die, monster, die. And who knows? You may die. Laughing at the comedy of terrors. Five of Carlos' creepiest capers in nightmare colors. And you are invited. If you rebuild it, they will come. They burned it down. If you rebuild it, they will come. You didn't hear them? Thank you, pardon. The voices. Pete. If you rebuild it, they will go. They blew it up. If you rebuild it, they will go. They demolished it. If you rebuild it, they will go. But horror has a permanent address. Welcome to my home. The house of Frankenstein lives. You see, uh, we began a project a few years ago, but unfortunately it was it was interrupted. And we're most anxious to take it up again. In September and October, the Fire and Water Podcast Network presents a Supermates tradition, covering four classic horror films and four related comic book adventures. I must find more victims before my work is done. You need look no further, vampires. We'll take the bat jet to the Hall of Justice and transform the other super friends. <laughs> Featuring an all-star cast. James Spader. What are you, crazy? Jack Nicholson. Oh, just marking my territory. Anthony Hopkins. She lives beyond the grace of God, a wanderer in the outer darkness. Lon Chaney Jr. One becomes accustomed to the darkness here. Michelle Pfeiffer. You're afraid that when it gets dark, you'll attack me. Vincent Price. Let's, uh... 
Let's see what the rest of this mausoleum looks like. Gary Oldman. Enters freely of your own will and leave some of the happiness you bring. Winona Ryder. I almost feel pity for anything so hunted as this count. Peter Cushing. I am a doctor of medicine, law, and physics. To the best of my knowledge, doctorates are not awarded for witchcraft. But if ever they are, no doubt I shall qualify for one. And Keanu Reeves. Doctor! This Halloween, visit our field of screams at the scenic house of Frankenstein, where terror is only a listen away. <laughs> Can the world's most cunning, depraved, ruthless killer kill again after he dies? The hands of Jack the Ripper live again as his fiendish daughter kills again. And again and again in Hands of the Ripper. Gory terror roams the streets as the hands of the Ripper murder once more. Rated R, under 17, not admitted without parents. Professor Frenzy, it's a show. Professor Frenzy, show. Professor Frenzy, it's a show. Professor Frenzy, show. Welcome to Professor Frenzy's Bedtime Stories, created especially for Monster Kid Radio. My name is Jerry Green. In this segment, I'm going to tell you a story from EC Horror Comics. Today's story is The Maestro's Hand. It is from Tales from the Crypt, number 18, the June-July issue from 1950. It was written by Bill Gaines and Al Feldstein, and the art was by Al Feldstein. So sit back and relax while I tell this staccato story. Dr. Hellman headed to a deserted log cabin in the woods to get some rest and try to forget all that he has been going through recently. There's a box on the doorstep. He picks it up and goes inside the cabin. He fretted. Why did Virginia kill herself? Why, oh why? He stared into the fire, remembering the night it all began. Flashback time. Dr. Hellman took his fiancée, Virginia Caddy, to hear the great concert pianist Vladimir Borston play. Virginia was so taken with the performance, she wanted to go backstage to meet the maestro. She did, and the pair made plans to talk at a future date. Virginia began meeting with Vladimir secretly, and the two fell in love. Virginia told Dr. Hellman that she was calling off their engagement, as she was going to marry Borstein. Hellman did not take the rejection well, but what are you going to do? One night, the great pianist cut his hand badly, and Virginia suggested he go to her ex for some emergency surgery. Dr. Hellman wouldn't still be mad, would he? Hellman gave Vladimir a knockout needle and sent Virginia home. He then returned to the sleeping pianist and removed his hand. When he awoke, Borston was distraught. He cursed Hellman for removing the hand and fled the office. The next day, the newspapers reported that the maestro Vladimir Borstein threw himself in front of a subway train and killed himself. Virginia visited Hellman in tears. She blamed Hellman and said she hated him. She went off and killed herself too. What a couple of days that was. Back in the log cabin, Dr. Hellman wondered what was in the box. What's in the box? He opened it up and inside found a human hand. The hand leapt out of the box and wrapped around Hellman's throat. He pulled it off and threw it into the fire, but it just crawled up the chimney. It got back into the house, played piano for a little while, and escaped into the fire once again and crawled after the bad doc. Hellman tripped over an ottoman trying to get away, and while he laid on the floor, the hand found its way to his throat and squeezed. When the police found him, they saw that Dr. Hellman's own hand was gripping his throat. He strangled himself. The end. I hope you enjoyed that out-of-key story. So, did the hand come to life and strangle Hellman, or was it all a figure of his guilty imagination? Who knows? I love the supernatural aspect of the story. Disembodied hands are one of my favorites since Thing from the Addams Family. The doctor got what he deserved. I get that he was upset about losing his fiancée, but you gotta stick with the Hippocratic Oath. That was out of line. 
I also appreciated the hand taking time to play piano in the log cabin. It's good stuff. All in all, this is a tightly told story that doesn't waste a panel. As usual, Al Feldstein delivers great illustrated storytelling. Hellman is shown with almost spirals around his eyes behind his glasses. He looks hypnotized by his jealousy. Virginia is a blonde femme fatale beauty, and Borstein is a mustachioed, kind of Latin-looking lover boy. A great trio that goes bad. If you're interested in a copy of Tales from the Crypt Volume 1, the book can be purchased on Amazon, and you can find a link to buy it on the MKR website. I hope you enjoyed the story. My name is Jerry Green, and you can find me on my podcast, The Professor Frenzy Show, where we talk about new indie comics and bat books for beginners, where we talk about historical Batman and Bat Family comics. You can also catch me on Twitter at Professor Frenzy and search for Professor Frenzy on YouTube, where you can find The Professor Frenzy Show and some exciting projects we have coming up. Stay tuned and thanks for listening. Professor Frenzy, it's a show. Professor Frenzy, show. Professor Frenzy, it's a show. Professor Frenzy, show. The man they are burying in a subterranean world of horror is a victim of the Oblong Box. Now, for the first time, Vincent Price and Christopher Lee star in Edgar Allan Poe's tale of the living dead, The Oblong Box. The Oblong Box in color from American International is rated M. Have you heard? Black Clock Audio Tales is a daily podcast that reads you a story, either a whole short story or a novel, a chapter or two at a time. Join us for our exploration of old ghost stories, supernatural fiction, horror tales, folk tales, fantasy, gothic horror, weird fiction, and cosmic horror. And don't forget to join us for our monthly show about the Cthulhu mythos at the end of the month. Black Clock Audio on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Black Clock Audio Tales. Part of darkmyths.org. Thank you. The cold, glossy pages of True Magazine call the killer shrew the world's most savage mammal. You'll never venture into a forest alone after you see The Killer Shrews with James Best and Ingrid Good, motion picture horror masterpiece, The Killer Shrews. Monster Kid Radio presents Dr. Tong's World of Monster Collectibles. Spanning the globe looking for monster goo so you don't have to. Dateline, Disneyland, California. Welcome, foolish mortals, to the haunted mansion. And on August 8th, 1969, with those words, Paul Freese introduced the world to the haunted mansion at Disneyland. It has been 50 years that the old Louisiana plantation house has sat ominously at the edge of New Orleans Square. Outside is all nice and neat and well-kept, but there are a few subtle hints here and there that something's not quite right with the old place. A horseless, horse-drawn hearse, small pet cemetery, as well as other various full-size tombstones dot the landscape. But travel inside, and that's where the fun starts. 999 happy haunts welcome you, hoping to make you ghost 1,000. The mansion has always been my happy place. I know that sounds particularly weird, but please don't judge me. I wrote it when I was a very young lad in the early 70s, and then again visited in the late 90s. It is a glorious place to visit, and then visit again, and again, and again. Say about 15 times in a day, that was my record. And this led to a rather sizable haunted mansion collection that I have amassed over the years. And I gotta tell you, Disney is not making it any easier now. With the 50th anniversary of the old girl unfolding earlier this month, Disney did not disappoint with merchandise for the event. It was a virtual landslide of goods. Several exclusive items were made available to guests that ponied up the dough to attend the official all-night 50th anniversary event in the park. T-shirts, pins, handbags, coffee mugs, puzzles, and more were the norm for the event. 
Some of the more eye-catching and in-demand items were the in-park large figural popcorn bucket, water bottle and beignet holder of Phineas, Gus, and Ezra, the Hitchhiking Ghosts, and then there was that exclusive Madame Leota glow-in-the-dark pop from the folks over at Funko. If you missed out on the fun, head on over to shopdisney.com and see what they have left from the celebration. I have my eye on that vinyl record picture disc once it comes back into stock. There's lots of mansion merchandise scheduled to be released into the real world for those of you that can't visit the park or in person or order online. There are several different Funko Pops scheduled to be released in early September. Various store exclusive figures, if you're either quick enough or lucky enough to find them, can be found at Target, Box Lunch, and Hot Topic to name a few. And with that, remember... Beware of hitchhiking ghosts. (laughs) Artist Spotlight! Taking a little trip off the beaten path for my artist spotlight this time, I usually feature an artist that makes monstrous cool goodies that you can purchase and add to your collections. Well, this time, I'm exposing you to someone who really gets a kick out of vintage Halloween images and icons. Kaylee Lee, working under the guise of Halloween Treasure Studio, has a knack for taking old items and repurposing them with paint into works of vintage Halloween art. Her items are simply amazing in that kooky, spooky sort of way, and each and every one of them is a one of a kind piece. Old clocks, toy slot machines, an old violin, old tin toy cars are just some of the objects that she has made into sinister Halloween inspired works of art. Witches, ghosts, skulls, devils, jack o' lanterns, owls, they're all here in their vintage Halloween glory. She does a run of items once a year, and once they're gone, they're gone. These are not cheap, and do remember, they are one-of-a-kind pieces. She has a mouth-watering picture gallery of past projects she has created on her website, HalloweenTreasureStudio.com. There, you can sign up for her mailing list and get notifications of when her next sinister sale is to happen. One day, one day I hope to have one of her pieces in my collection. Now, excuse me, I need to go change my drool bucket. Vintage Monster Toys! This week, I'm delving into the world of foreign monster toy collecting. More to the point, Japanese Keshi. Zeroing in on the Bandai Horror World figures. In the past, I have explained what the term Keshi has meant, but for those of you that have not been paying attention, here we go again. Keshi simply refers to the small multicolored rubber figures that were produced in mass quantities, mainly out of Japan. Recently, Super 7 has been making their own versions of Keshi figures. The Blind Box Universal Monster figures are a prime example of what Keshi is. In the late 80s, Bandai released onto the world a series of Keshi so devious, so maniacal, that they have been driving monster collectors mad ever since. Why, you ask? The series, known simply as Horror World, has 17 different figures, and they were released in multiple colors, making completing a whole set a near impossibility. Add to that, they were released in Japan almost exclusively, making collectors here in the States ravenous for them, like stick your dog's head in the toilet ravenous. And there, yet again, is another obscure movie reference from the doctor, but I do digress. These 17 different one and a half inch tall monsters cover the gamut of the genre. Starting out with the classics, Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, The Bride, Wolfman, The Mummy, Phantom of the Opera, Cheney's Quasimodo, and The Creature from the Black Lagoon. And we start to stray a little bit with Nosferatu, A Mole Man, The Fly, and The Metaluna Mutant. Now here's where things get a little weird. There are two different versions of The Thing. First off, there's the Arnes Carrot Monster from the Howard Hawks film version. And then there is what essentially is the Norris Spiderhead from the John Carpenter's 1982 remake. And then these last three are just head scratchers. There's a Norman Bates, Anthony Perkins, sporting a knife. A short squat, Alfred Hitchcock. And last but not least is a shark, and I'm guessing it's from Jaws, with a frightened naked person sitting on his back. These figures are small. They're really cool, and they're really amazing in person. But do you want my advice? 
don't start collecting them. They are super addictive and they are hard to find and they can be fairly expensive when found. If you must have them in your collection, I wish you good luck and happy hunting. And if you do happen to get any duplicates, please keep me in mind. And once again, you got any sneak peeks of monster merchandise coming out soon? Or feedback on the DTWOMC segments? Drop Derek a line and he'll forward it along to me here at MKR. And if you're interested, you can see what's going on in my toy shop over on Instagram at Dr. Tongues Toys, as well as on Facebook under Dr. Tongues I Had That Shop. Or on my private account, MonsterMan64, to see some of the cool stuff I pick up for my own personal collection. This is Mark, Dr. Tongue Peterson, saying, Happy Monster Collecting, everybody. I'm out. Peace. Dr. Tongue, Mark, there is no judgment here regarding the Haunted Mansion. I love that attraction. I love all things Haunted Mansion. I wouldn't be a monster kid if I didn't love the Haunted Mansion. Solidarity, brother. Here at last, the amazing authentic story of Jack the Ripper, the unknown killer whose mass murders shocked the world. The actual cases in the actual setting, London, a city torn apart by fear and hate as the mob howled for the blood of the human monster Scotland Yard could never catch. Every lunatic and sensation seeker in London has given himself up as Jack the Ripper. Stop using that stupid name! I didn't christen him, sir, but the one who did knew what he was talking about. Have you ever seen any of his victims? Who was this archfiend who struck in the night? Why were prostitutes his chosen victims? Mary Clark. Mary Clark. Are you Mary Clark? Who was Mary Clark? The mystery woman who held the key to his strange passions. What was the ghastly trademark he left on every corpse? These wounds are not the savage slashings of a maniac. A careful, well-defined abdominal incisions that show a good knowledge of anatomy and surgery. Now you'll see this sensational true story from the files of Scotland Yard revealed in all its shocking scope. Girls the Ripper marked for death, caught in the grip of uncontrollable hysteria. The wild gay nights of the turbulent city shadowed by the bloodlust of the most terrifying killer of all time. The Ripper, he's done it in. The Ripper, he's done another of them. The Ripper, he's done it again. The Ripper's done you too will be swept along in a spell of seething panic as the screen gives a startling answer to the most baffling question in the history of crime. terrific names in Scream Evil, together in one shock show. Horror of Frankenstein and Scars of Dracula. Your ticket entitles you to be frightened out of your wits at no extra charge. Horror of Frankenstein and Scars of Dracula, in color, rated R. Zombies! Halabi! Halabi! From award-winning author Stephen D. Sullivan, White Zombie, a new novel based on the classic motion picture. What do you see? Neil asked. Madeline peered into the wine glass, pretending to be a fortune teller, and for a moment her head reeled. She did see something within the depths of the cup. Terrible dark eyes staring up at her, boring into her mind, the eyes of that awful man they'd encountered in the road. You see? She felt dizzy now, really dizzy, and her throat was tight, as if cold hands were closing around her neck. What is it? Neil asked, concerned. The eyes burned into her. She couldn't breathe. I see, she managed to gasp. Death. Available now in print and all ebook formats.
Find it on Amazon, Smashwords, Drive Through Fiction, and other quality outlets. Also available in a special edition, including the complete movie script. Grab White Zombie before it grabs you. Details at sdsullivan.com. That is no other way. Hello there, Monster Kid Radioheads. This is Kenny with a look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. This week, we will continue our issue-by-issue look at how films we have seen before or have not seen yet were featured in FM. Today's issue is number four, from August of 1959. Only one film received an article-length feature, and that was 1932's The Mummy with Boris Karloff. The article actually looks at all the Universal Mummy films, but the bulk of it is dedicated to a detailed film book about the first Hemotep film. Let's take a look at a couple of highlights. One of the most memorable moments is when the mummy first awakened. Here is how it is described in FM number 4. The mummy's hand, in the case nearby, moves about the length of an ant. It's not a large move, to be sure, but it is a terrifyingly significant one for it is the first sign of life in the mummy for 3,700 years. A finger stirs a fraction of an inch, and a fed grains of dust trickle down the rotted wrappings. One of Imhotep's eyes flickers. They open slowly, painfully to life. Noted Egyptianist Walter J. Dougherty reported at the time, this is the top screen chill I've ever had, this heart-stopping moment when the mummy comes to life. A San Francisco newspaper reporter observed, Children whooped and hollered at the opening night performance. The teenage sons and daughters of those children of 1932 are no doubt holding this magazine in their hands right now. The picture's thrills are strong enough to satisfy the most exacting juvenile critics, and its plot and treatment along the lines of the Tutankhamun curse are more than sufficient for adults. Young Norton ages into old Norton in a horror-packed half-second as he glances up to find the living mummy at his side, hand outstretched, saying, Good evening, my name's Imhotep. Could you direct me to the nearest pyramid? Well, the dialogue didn't run exactly like that, and after all, an editor's memory can be forgiven for getting hazy after 27 years. But Norton really did go off his rocker when Karloff shuffled out of his upright coffin and over to the table. The shock was so great that Norton burst into hysterical laughter. His mind snapped at the unbelievable sight, and he died some time later, still laughing maniacally. And how about the thrilling finale? Here is how it was described. At the end of a room, a great statue of Isis towers. Summoning her strength, Helen runs to the goddess idol and flings herself at its feet, praying frantically in the ancient tongue. Chef Tebrié, Mim Moset, Zit Sakem, Imhotep, knife raised to plunge it into Helen, is frozen in terror as the right arm of the idol slowly moves. Isis offers to Helen the Cruz and Sada, the all-powerful symbol of eternal life. And to Imhotep, who sought to take the life of her priestess, Isis offers death. A jagged bolt of blinding light leaps forth from the goddess, striking the mummy and disintegrating him. Imhotep is no more. The article was nine pages long and featured eight photos from different Universal Mummy films, including an interesting shot of artist Willie Pagney sketching Karloff as Imhotep with Boris in full makeup looking on. Have we seen The Mummy before on Monster Kid Radio? Let's see. The first Universal Mummy movie on MKR was Abbott Costello Meet the Mummy, which was the 46th film featured. The 74th film was The Mummy's Hand. And then film 82 was The Mummy's Tomb. Here we go. The 108th film covered by Monster Kid Radio, The Mummy, with guest Steve Sullivan, Monster Kid Radio number 261 from March of 2016. If you love The Mummy and haven't heard Derek and Steve talk about it, go back to the archive and take a listen. That's all for this week's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. This is Kenny for MKR. We'll be back with more next week. Ila Likor. That's how you say adios in Egypt. Death. Eternal punishment. For 
anyone who opens this casket. The mummy. Is it dead or alive? Human or inhuman? You'll know. You'll see. You'll feel the awful, creeping, crawling terror that stands your hair on end and brings a scream to your lips. <coughs> There's nothing on earth like the mummy. You will not remember what I show you now. And yet I shall awaken memories of love and crime and death. Now I know his horrible plan. He is going to kill her and make her a living mummy like himself. <laughs> Hello, this is Rod Barnett, the host of The Bloody Pit, the podcast about eclectic film from across the decade. On The Bloody Pit, we've covered Godzilla movies, Doctor Who movies starring Peter Cushing, The Outer Limits, Fu Manchu, Doc Savage, old radio shows, my favorite movies of all time, a Lucio Fulci film or two, 1970s science fiction movies, and a long series on the films of Italian maestro Antonio Margheriti. So if you're curious to learn a little bit about some of the stranger areas of cult film and television, join me and my rotating group of co-hosts on The Bloody Pit. You might even learn something about Coffin Joe. And that's scary, people. Very scary. Watch out for them. A menace never known to man or beast before. An endless horde of crawling, crushing, gigantic creatures. So horrifying there was no word to describe them. Watch out for them. Watch out for Warner Brothers' screaming new shock sensation, them. Yes, I saw them. They were huge and scaly, and they had gigantic jaws, and, and then one came at me. Kill one, and two take its place. This is the endless onslaught of them, clawing up out of the earth from mile-deep catacombs. See them, the most astounding journey into terror ever taken, starring James Whitmore, Edmund Gwen, Joan Weldon, and James Arness. Them! <laughs> When this dead hand moves, the monster created by a man they called Mad is turned loose to strike terror into the hearts of men. (laughs) To shock women into uncontrolled hysteria. Elizabeth! (laughs) To prey upon the innocence of children. This is the story you've heard about, talked about. The spine-tingling, blood-chilling story that stuns your emotions. Frankenstein. This is Count Dracula, and I'm here to offer you a friendly warning. Derek and his guests often get excited, and occasionally this results in revealing key plot points of the movies they're discussing. You know how the children of the night, ah, I mean monster kids, can get sometimes. So consider yourself warned, 
and don't come begging to me to kill them for their transgressions afterward. I have more pressing issues to take care of, like that pesky von Helsing. We're so happy to have historian and writer here, Greg Mang. Thank you very much. Always a great pleasure to be here at Monster Bash, all this wonderful energy that everybody brings to it. I appreciate uh, everybody being here, and uh, we're going to start our presentation on the Laird Krigar saga, a.k.a. I Wake Up Screaming with Laird Krigar. Uh, we'll explain that subtitle a little bit later. Laird Krigar's most famous role, and that is Jack the Ripper in The Lodger. They're showing The Lodger after this presentation. If you've never seen it, please do. It is a magnificent horror film, and his performance is one of the great virtuoso performances in horror film history. It's the role that most people remember him for. Unfortunately, he's pretty largely forgotten today. And actually, to start our, uh, our story today, we're not going to talk about The Lodger. We're going to talk about his next film. And that is a film called Hanging the Square. The police tell strange tales about this man, who at one moment is a tender lover, and in the next moment, the fiendish slave of his own desire to kill. And this has been going on all the time, I suppose. Now, look here, my dear Paul. And it's going to be all right in a day or two. But at the piano, she said... No, <laughs> my dear fellow, don't she get up there. Me. She whispered to me, she promised, you could have me, she said. Never has such a gripping story been so realistically enacted. Breathtaking indeed are the performances of Laird Cragar, Linda Dornell, George Sanders, Glenn Langan, Bay Marlowe, and others. Why don't you go away and leave me alone? But well, George, you, you can't let me down now. Please. This goes on and on. These songs mean nothing to me. What do I get out of them? You could get me. If Larry Grigar was tormented here, great big gaping eyes looking out at you, he had reason to. First of all, he was being paid to look that way, all right? It was the role he was playing. He was playing a gentle Hyde composer who has these dark moods, and he has just knifed a man to death and then set the body on fire, saying this is coming back to him what he's done. So he's, he's supposed to look tormented and anguished. Well, he had other things in his real life that were also contributing to him looking this anguished. First of all, in real life, he was very hungry. All right, he'd been on a diet for about a year and a half, and had lost over 100 pounds. He was down to about 235 pounds, which gives you an idea of how heavy he was, all right, when he started. At this point, however, he had accelerated the diet, and he was dieting, taking in about 500 calories a day which is basically starvation, all right? 500 calories a day. We'll talk about that, why he was being so possessed about this a little bit later. Another reason he looks unhappy here is the fact that he is very unhappily typecast, right? Some people are typecast as a femme fatale. Some people are typecast as a hero. In the case of Larry Krigar, he was typecast as a sexually deranged homicidal maniac. <laughs> What's wrong with that? All right, and it was really getting on his nerves. All right, he was getting fed up with it. Uh, he was fighting with the studio, trying to get them to give him different kinds of roles. Wanted to walk out, wanted to be released. All right, the studio was fighting back. They were releasing all kinds of terrible stories about him, leaking stories, all right, about his private life, which were designed to humiliate him, to upset him, <coughs> break his heart, doing all those things. So he was very, very upset about that. And another thing that was happening at this time is that he was haunted by a letter he had received from a 16-year-old girl in Canada, which said, in essence, Dear Mr. Krigar, I love you. You're my favorite actor. I dream of you at night, creeping into my house with your Jack the Ripper knife and butchering both my parents in their bed. Please send me an autographed picture. <laughs> <laughs> so, all this is wearing on the poor man, 
And he decides he is going to, while he's making this picture, completely change everything about himself. All right, he is going to keep dieting on this terrible diet, get very slender. He's going to have plastic surgery, change his face. All right, he's going to have a complete transformation. He's going to become, as the expression goes, that he uses a beautiful man. And the studio will never again cast in this type of way. Well, tragically, Larry Prigar suffered two heart attacks from all the anxiety, all the dieting, and died. And he was only 31 years old. Hangover Square was released after his death. Well, let's move on to happier times. Happier times such as the day he was born. Laird Prigar, actual full name Samuel Laird Prigar, uh, was born on July 28, 1913, in the Mount Airy section of Philadelphia. Now, if you've never heard of Laird Prigar, don't feel too badly. The people who live in the house where he was born have never heard of Larry Krigar. Other thing to point out here is that the name is Krigar. He always used to tell people it's Larry Krigar, pronounced as for saying cigar. So that's the uh, clue to remembering how to say his name. He was the youngest of six strapping boys. Their father died when Sammy, as he was called at the time, as we'll refer to him for right now, when Sammy was less than three years old, and uh, he was raised by his mother and his aunt. And although the family had no connection with the theater, Sammy used to say, from my very first moment of consciousness, I knew I wanted to be an actor. Right? I had to be an actor. In 1920, when Sammy was seven years old, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde came out. Sammy, of course, being a little kid, wasn't allowed to go see it. It was way too racy and horrifying for his mother to allow him to see it. But he heard about it. And of course, he heard about how John Barrymore did the transformations from Jekyll to Hyde without any makeup. Well, of course, Barrymore did obviously use some makeup. But nevertheless, a lot of it was the expression, all right, and the body language and that sort of thing. And so Sammy heard about John Barrymore doing this, and he was really impressed. Barrymore also was a Philadelphia boy. All right, so he thought, I want to grow up and be just like John Barrymore, even though he actually never seen him perform. What he did do, however, is that when the other kids were out playing, Sammy, at the age of seven, would go up to neighbors' houses, knock on the door. Dole would answer the door and say, yeah, Sammy, what do you want? Sammy would say, would you like to see me do Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? <laughs> and the adult would say, well, yeah, mm -hmm, well, all right. So... Sammy would do what he had heard John Barrymore do, all right? I mean, you know, he'd paint him high, you know, drinking the potion, and then he'd grab his neck and shake his head around and jump up in the air and fall on the neighbor's porch and roll around, all right, and carry on. And then he'd get up, and he'd look up at the neighbor, and he'd distort his face, you know, something like that, and look up at the neighbor. Right? And the neighbor would look down at him and say, very nice, Sammy, very nice. I think I hear your mother calling you. <laughs> and off he go. We jump ahead almost 20 years, 1939. Laird Prigar, as he now calls himself, Strop the Samuel, is at the Pasadena Playhouse in California. He's had a vagabond early life, but he's at the Pasadena Playhouse. There's only one problem. He's so doggone big, they can't really put him in a play because everybody else looks so small next to him. He gets some couple good parts. He gets in the Miracle of the Swallows, which is the program there the Great American Family, another one. But basically, he is so big, he's considered, as he puts it in his own words, a grotesque. He's a grotesque because he's so big and so heavy. He gets a couple little bits and a couple little B movies, but basically things are going really badly for him. By late 1939, Laird Krigar is living in a friend's car, basically destitute. In 1938, they're gonna play done on Broadway called Oscar Wilde, Robert Morley played the part of Oscar Wilde. The play was a very candid examination of Oscar Wilde's life and proclivities and so on and so forth, and his court trial and his alcoholic downfall in Paris and so on and so forth. It was a big hit, but very controversial. Spencer Tracy went to see it on a trip to New York. As Spencer Tracy came out, the press was waiting for him. The press said to Spencer Tracy, Mr. Tracy, what did you think of the play? And Tracy said, well, I thought Robert Morley was great, but I thought the play was obscene. And after seeing it, I don't feel clean. Uh, plays should uplift people. They shouldn't be plays like Oscar Wilde. Well, meanwhile, Larry Krigar, out in California, living in a car, 
is dreaming if he could only play the role of Oscar Wilde. If he could somehow get the rights to this play and play Oscar Wilde, and an audience would see him in this dream role, he'd become a star. Because right? he would be so perfect for it. He would be so great for it. So he does a rather strange thing. He starts crashing Hollywood parties. Then he takes out the script of Oscar Wilde and just starts reading it aloud, right around the pool or around the bar or wherever. And a crowd gathers, and he figures if he does this long enough, he'll attract a producer who will put on the play with him playing the title role. And it actually works. He finds a producer who never produced a play. He finds a director who never directed a play. And they lease the uh, El Capitan Theater on Hollywood Boulevard, and they put on the play Oscar Wilde. Now, if there was ever a play production that appeared absolutely doomed to failure, it was this one. All male cast, play about, as Oscar Wilde put it, the love that dare not speak its name, and a star who's living in a car. Well, the play opens the night of April 22nd, 1940, and when the curtain goes down, the audience rises to its feet and cheers. He has been an incredible smash. Indeed, Larry Krigar is an overnight star. Word spreads out in Hollywood that he is a genius. All kinds of famous people come to see him, including John Barrymore. And John Barrymore, who of course is a wreck by now, but nevertheless knows good acting when he sees it. John Barrymore comes backstage after the play, goes up to Laird and says, you are the finest young actor that I have seen in the past 10 years. And Laird just stands there and cries. Right? This is just, you know, incredible. Imagine that kind of praise from John Barrymore. Well, 20th Century Fox signs Laird to a contract. All right, 20th Century Fox, of course, Tyrone Power, who we see there on the right, all right, is the leading star. John Carradine is at 20th Century Fox. He's 20th Century Fox's leading character actor. And Laird always jokes after that point, he says the reason that he signed with 20th Century Fox is because the other character actor at the lot was John Carradine. And he said, of course, we could never buy for roles because Laird at the time weighed over 300 pounds and John Carradine at the time probably weighed under 150 pounds. First picture Laird makes is Hudson's Bay. That's him, of course, up there in the fort. Uh, prominently there, he plays a pioneer in the Canadian wilderness named Gooseberry. Next to him is the romantic lead in the film, John Sutton. And down there, as you almost hardly notice, is Paul Muni. And this is interesting that Muni is kind of lost in there because Paul Muni is the biggest camera hall in Hollywood. And Laird is making his first picture with Paul Muni, who, of course, is a terrible experience to work with because he's so selfish. In fact, Muni only agreed to do this particular film after he spent a whole weekend with the writers rewriting the script and giving himself more lines, most of which are speeches, one of which runs an incredible two minutes and 15 seconds while he just talks and talks and talks about Canada. Well, in those days when Paul Muni made a film, his wife, whose name was Bella, would sit in a canvas chair underneath the camera and after Muni played a scene, he would look at Bella. He wouldn't look at the director, he wouldn't look at the cameraman. He would look at Bella. If Bella nodded her head, it meant that he had dominated the scene, played everybody else off, and had been the star. If she shook her head, it meant somebody else had been noticed, and they had to do the scene over again. So, they played their first scene, Paul Muni and Larry Pigar. After the scene, Mrs. Muni, Mrs. Muni sitting in the chair watching. Paul Muni looks over at Bella. Bella goes, they do the scene again. They do the scene a third time, fourth time. By the fifth time, he's looking over at Bella. She's going. <laughs> <laughs> Larry's not trying to steal photos or steal scenes. He's just so good. He is so great. He's got such presence and everything else that you can't help but look at it. This goes on for a while. It actually gets to the end of the production, and the word is so out in Hollywood that Laird has completely dominated the picture, but Daryl Zanuck, the head of 20th Century Fox, puts Hudson's Bay back into production, try to give Muni more to do, shoot more scenes with Muni, most of which are filmed from the waist up, you know, with nobody else in the picture. Even that way, it's just too bad for Muni. Hudson's Bay comes out, is previewed around Christmas of 1940, and the critics basically say there's this great, terrific, new giant of a character actor in movies. His name is Larry Grigar. He practically walks away with Hudson's Bay. And by the way, Paul Muni is also in the movie, if you happen to notice. 
<laughs> Larry's in the business, all right? And the next film he makes with Tyrone Power is Blood and Sand, the great bullfighting epic in Technicolor. He plays a critic, the great Koro of the bull ring. And he is a vile character. And he enjoys watching Tyrone Power in the bull ring. And he enjoys watching Tyrone Power out of the bull ring, if you get my drift. And I just kind of slip this in past the censors. Blood and Sand is a great movie uh, for character actors. You notice up here that uh, next to Tyrone Power, you see J. Carol Nash. And of course, in the middle of the scene, you see John Carradine. And you see Laird down there in the corner. Laird's big scene in Blood and Sand. Tyrone Power gets really angry at him, slandering him at the end of the movie, near the end of the movie, and he goes up to him in an outdoor cafe, and he pours wine in his face. And Tyrone Power says to Laird, I bet you've never even been baptized. Well, I'm going to baptize you now. I christen you liar, and your second name is Swine. Great dialogue. And he dumps the wine in his face, and Laird sputters and prowls and spits and carries on, and and the audience has cheered when Tyrone Power did this, and it was just wonderful. That movie is Charlie's Aunt, a comedy. And uh, the actors up there are Edmund Gwen, that's Jack Benny, dressed up as Charlie's Aunt, and Laird on the right. Now, the funny thing about this movie, one of the funny things about this movie, it's a very funny movie anyway, but one of the funny things about it is that Jack Benny in this movie is playing a college boy. All right? And he wasn't even 39 at the time. Okay? He was actually 47. Okay? He was 47 years old, playing a college boy. Laird played the father of Jack Benny's college roommate. Laird, at the time, was 27 years old. But of course, he was so big, he was great at suggesting age. Here is where he really made it. Here's where he gets started. This is a terrific movie. This is the movie I wake up screaming. Terrific noir melodrama, 1941. He plays a psychopathic detective with his insane love for this dead blonde whose murder he's investigating. He is incredibly creepy, and although in 1941 the Hayes office, the Green office, wouldn't allow perverts in the movies, Laird manages to really kind of get it between the lines and suggest a real pervert in this picture. He is very, very creepy. He's trying to pin the murder in the film on Victor Mature, and at one point they ride up town and notice that there takes a shoestring and ties it into a hangman's noose and dangles it in front of him that he's going to get him and hound him into his grave and so on and so forth and enjoy his execution. Laird said he realized what a success he was in this movie, how much audiences hated him, when he began getting mail from people who said in long lists all the various ways in which they would enjoy killing him. <laughs> People take the movie seriously sometimes. And this kind of brings us back to our subtitle. And that is that when, uh, some of you may remember this, back when I was a teenager and they would show movies on The Late Show, between commercials, all right, they would come back from the commercial and they would announce the movie. They would say, you're watching this particular movie with these particular stars. So I remember watching this movie the first time, and they came back after the commercial and they said, you're watching I Wake Up Screaming with Betty Grable. <laughs> I thought, hmm, interesting. Right? And then they came back from the next commercial and they said, You're watching I Wake Up Screaming with Victor Mature. <laughs> so that's interesting too. And they came back a little later and said, You're watching I Wake Up Screaming with Betty Griegel, Victor Mature, and Laird Frigar. Right? So that's a real big bed, right? I mean, I'm screaming with all of them. Uh, at any rate. At this point, he's a big star, big character actor star. Twenty Century Fox starts loaning him out. He's loaned out to RKO for Joan of Paris, in which he appears as a as a Gestapo uh, villain. At the end of the picture, he slaps Michelle Morgan's face really, really hard. He's in This Gun for Hire with Alan Ladd. Uh, he plays sort of a comic villain in that, although he uh, he's, he's a really pretty wild character. Again, sets up Alan Ladd for assassination. This Gun for Hire again, great noir melodrama, nineteen forty two. And he's really doing well. He's in other movies with 20th Century Fox and so on and so forth. So, we're talking about his professional life. Now that Larry Krigar is a star, what can we talk about about his private life? Well, Laird really enjoyed going to costume parties in Hollywood in drag. Sometimes he went to parties in Hollywood in drag when they weren't costume parties. <laughs> Uh, this is an example. 
All right, this was actually, you know, you notice that uh, Cesar Romero and George Montgomery, they're in their cities. They're not, uh, they're not dressed up at all. But this was a party for, uh, in honor of the Max Sennett bathing beauties. So Laird felt that he should come dressed up as a Max Sennett bathing beauty, as the old-time bathing apparel and the wig and so on and so forth. All right, uh, it's important to note, the same weekend that he appeared at this party, just like this, he was at the 20th Century Fox annual party that they would give every year for their employees and they would provide entertainment. And at that particular event, he and Milton Berle were the closing act. And they both came out dressed as Carmen Miranda. <laughs> <laughs> with the you know, fruit basket hat on their heads and the castanets. And saying mama mama terra, and then and that sort of thing, and went all around the stage. They were dueling Mirandas with their castanets, and of course the audience was on the floor watching these two guys, especially Laird, because of the fact he weighed 300 pounds up there shaking it as Carmen Miranda. Another thing he did was that he brought out his niece Betsy to live with him, the spoiler. She was the daughter of one of his brothers who had died, and as a result, he, uh, he contacted Betsy's mother and said, Let her come out with me for the summer of 1941 and let me spoil her and have fun with her. And Betsy ended up staying there for 15 months. And fortunately, Betsy was still alive when I started to work on the book and uh, had wonderful stories to tell me about. She called him her Uncle Sam and used his actual first name, Sam. Uncle Sam. She said one day behind the house in Beverly Hills, she was trying to do a cartwheel and she couldn't quite do it. And she kept falling on her rump. So Uncle Sam came out in that incredible white suit that we see him in right there. And he said, you know, what's the matter, Betsy, dear? And she said, oh, Uncle Sam, I'm trying to do a cartwheel. I just can't do it. And he said, here, let me show you. She said, he went across the yard and put his hands up. And she said, that man did a cartwheel like a circus performer. She said, not only did he do one cartwheel, he did like three cartwheels coming toward me. In that white suit, she said, it looked like an avalanche. <laughs> hey, for me. But I knew it was Uncle Sam. He landed on his feet right in front of her and said, they're busy. That's all there is to it. And uh, she said he could do anything as far as, uh, as far as she was concerned. He just, she just, just adored him. Well, that brings us to the 1942 Academy Awards, which were awful. They're, they're always awful, right? I mean, the, the Oscars are always dreadful. But in 1942, they really had kind of reached a new low. They were very, very long, very disorganized. They didn't end until after midnight, at which time they announced the best actress of the year, of course, was Greer Garson for Mrs. Miniver. And she was presented the Oscar by June Fontaine, who had won the year before. Well, as you probably know, if you know anything about Oscar history and lore, Greer Garson was rumored to have given the longest acceptance speech in the history of the Academy Awards. There's, there's no newsreel of it or anything because they basically stopped the newsreel after she kept on talking. And, and Joan Fontaine eventually went over and sat down on the stage because Greer kept on going. But they figured that the speech probably was about six and a half minutes, which is still a hell of a long speech, right? Six and a half minutes. What was even funnier about the speech was the fact that when Greer Garst went up to accept the Oscar, she began by saying, of course in her British accent, I am practically unprepared. <laughs> they went on for six and a half minutes talking about all kinds of things, including the arbitrary nature of, of awards, and there's so many fine actresses. And da -da 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 -da. Well, this was such a mess and caused so much talk that Danny Kay, who was new to Hollywood at the time, had a party a few days later, and they had a mock Oscar ceremony. All right, joke Oscars given out to ridicule the Academy Awards. All right, and they gave all kinds of joke Oscars, some of which were, you know, they couldn't publish about and were unrepeatable and all that kind of thing. But it was during 1942 that Laird had appeared in the film The Black Swan, a pirate movie, in which he played Captain Henry Morgan. While they were announcing the Oscars, the mock Oscars at Danny Kaye's party, they said, and this year, the award for best female impersonator of the year goes to Laird Krigar for the Black Swan. <laughs> Laird goes galloping up on the stage. He's a great mimic. And in a perfect imitation of Greer Garson's voice, he says, I am practically unprepared. 
<laughs> and it went on for over half an hour. <laughs> Thanking everybody and saying things like, you know, uh, awards of this nature are so arbitrary because there are so many fine female impersonators in Hollywood. It's unfair to pick me up, that sort of thing. It goes on and on. And of course, what happened was, Greer Garson later said in, in, in her later years, she said, the reason everybody remembered that I spoke for so long wasn't because I actually spoke for so long, it was because of that Laird Krigar, all right, at that party. You know, and he ridiculed my acceptance speech, and a lot of people at the party, so they all began believing that I really didn't speak that long, when actually I did. It was him, all right, it was his fault. So anyway, he also would volunteer at the, um, in, in Hollywood, at the Hollywood Canteen, and uh, he would be a busboy, go down there and work, and very jolly, and, and really enjoyed doing his party. Of course, wasn't able to serve, be in the service because of various health problems related to his weight. So he's doing really fine. He's having a very interesting, colorful life in Hollywood at this point, doing very well in his career. Well, almost inevitably, he plays the devil. Pictures heaven can wait, and he plays the devil, and he is an extremely charming, gentle, compassionate devil. Really, really fine performance and, and very offbeat. You really like him. Uh, I know, is Father Mike here? Yeah. yeah, well, if you watch this film, you might change your mind about the devil. <laughs> uh, because uh, he's, he's a really nice devil, and, and you, you, you'd like him. All right? <laughs> that brings us to The Lodger. Now, as far as The Lodger goes, this is, I, I think, a terrific movie. I, I, I think the best three horror films, in my humble opinion, of the 1940s are The Body Snatcher, number one, The Lodger, number two, and Hangover Square, number three. Of course, I'm very prejudiced wow. because of the actors who are in them. I think they're the top three. But um, this is a, a really fantastic movie. There's several factors about The Lodger which are really interesting and, and rather unusual for the time. One of them is the aspect of sex. Merle Oberon plays a dance hall girl, and she and her girls do a dance called the Parisian Trot, which is basically a can-can. And uh, one of the critics in New York, when the film comes out, says, you have to see this movie so that you can see Merle Oberon do her remarkable front view can-can. Because this was really racy stuff. Merle Oberon, when she dances, she shows off her legs and her stockings and her really lacy panties and all this stuff. And, you know, the censors are going crazy about this in the movie but they got by with it, all right? So a lot of, a lot of sex content. Also, interesting facet in this movie is that the women can't scream. That's because we know in horror films, you know, Faye Ray, Evelyn Angers, all the rest, they scream like crazy, right? They're always screaming. In this movie, the women are so scared, they get vocally paralyzed, and they can't scream. This is Doris Lloyd, uh, who in fact uh, was a good personal friend of Larry Krigar, uh, playing the victim. This is a great scene where you see her being killed from the Ripper's point of view and the camera coming in and jerking all around and everything. And she's trying to scream and she just cannot scream for help. And the other aspect of it that is remarkable is Laird. His performance in this film is just absolutely breathtaking. And he, the way he builds it is quite incredible. Because at the beginning, he's very soft-spoken and very gentle and very shy. And by the end of the film, he is this rampaging monster, all right, running through the theater. And George Sanders trying to catch him. George Sanders keeps shooting him, and he won't stop. All right, he just keeps running. Well, again, one of the critics said, you know, in this film, uh, Larry Krigar's Jack the Ripper takes more bullets than Frankenstein's monster ever had to absorb. And, and he just is, is brilliant. But also, something else that he does in the film that is really, really cool, and again, ahead of the time. He suggests things in his characterization that weren't really in the script, but are there the way he interprets the lines. For example, he explains at one point to his landlady, Sarah Allgood up there, that the reason that he, uh, well, he doesn't say the reason I kill women, which doesn't admit that he's doing it, but he talks about the reason he's a heartbroken man is because of the fact that his brother was ruined by an actress. And the way Laird plays the scene the way he looks at this cameo of his brother, and the way he talks, the way he uses his voice and expression and everything, you really get the impression that this man was in love with his brother, incestuous relationship with his brother. And a lot of people pointed that out when the movie came out, and since this kind of, kind of took it and kind of you know, tuned it up to a whole other level of weirdness in the picture. Uh, remarkable to watch. Maybe the best way to talk about his performance in The Lodger, which again, they're going to show after this talk, and it would be best just to see the movie, uh, is something that happened during it. 
Laird was very good friends with the actor David Bacon and David Bacon's wife, whose name was Greta Keller. She was a German-Austrian singer. During the making of The Lodger, September of 1943, David Bacon one Sunday drove his car off into a bean field, jumped out, yelled, help me, and fell down dead. David Bacon, incidentally, some of you might remember, he's in the Masked Marvel serial, and he had just finished that Masked Marvel serial at the time, that shortly before he died. It turns out, interestingly enough, that David Bacon had been stabbed, managed to drive his car far enough to get out of the, out of the car and collapse. Like Jack the Ripper, the killer obviously had used a knife, and like Jack the Ripper, the killer was never caught. In fact, somebody I talked to only recently said that they had been looking into this and that it's still an open case in Los Angeles after all these years. His wife, David Bacon's wife, Greta Keller, collapses at the terrible news of her husband's murder. She gets into her bed and is completely distraught, traumatized. The press in LA manages to break into the house nevertheless. Meanwhile, rumors start to circulate about David Bacon and what his private life was like. That picture of him up in the upper right-hand corner where he is painting his toenails was supposed to suggest, obviously, what his private life was about. Actually, the press took that picture out of his Harvard yearbook where he was making himself up to play a woman in a play. But that's the picture that was published. Poor Greta Keller is so distraught by all this, she eventually has to go to the hospital. She is pregnant at the time of this tragedy. After she goes to the hospital, she loses the baby. The whole area in Hollywood considers her, however, a pariah, right, because of what has happened in this terrible scandal, these rumors about her husband. However, Laird Krugar does something quite remarkable. He takes Greta Keller into his home, takes her out of the hospital, takes her to his home up in Coldwater Canyon, which is basically, his home is like a little redwood cottage, hardly enough room in it for Laird, all right, to, to be. But he takes her up there and he nurses her back to health, which both is a sign of what a remarkable man he was. And also, however, you think about while he's playing the lodger, he's coming home every night to his cottage, to a woman whose husband was killed by a knife murderer. So if you think about that, if you watch The Lodger. The film opened uh, in January of 1944 at the Roxy Theater in New York. Laird was there for the opening. After the first showing, he went up on stage. And the audience gave him a five-minute ovation. Poured it in the papers the next day. One other thing to mention about this movie, because this film, of course, is not nearly as well known as some of the other horror titles that we talk about. But a couple years ago, a few years ago, I talked about The Body Snatcher. And we said The Body Snatcher was the most popular of the Val Luton horror films from RKL. He took in the most money. The Body Snatcher took in a worldwide rental of $550,000. The Lodger took in a worldwide rental of $2.2 million. This was an enormous hit. And of course, it was a mixed blessing for Laird because not only was it a great showcase for what a great actor it was, as far as the audiences around the world were concerned at this point, he was Jack the Ripper. Where do you go from there? Laird was set to do the film Laura. And of course, I guess a lot of us are familiar with the film Laura, one of the great uh, detective stories and melodramas of the 40s, right? Laird was supposed to play Waldo Leidecker in Laura, uh, the part that Clifton Webb eventually played, you know, the very waspish tongued columnist. Laird was very excited about playing it. But Otto Preminger, who was the producer of Laura and who eventually directed the film, Otto Preminger said, no, no way. We are not putting Larry Krigar in this movie. As soon as the audience sees him in the film, they'll figure he's got to be the killer. And of course, Otto Leidecker is the killer. And he said, no, no, he's, he's, he's Larry Krigar, he's Jack the Ripper. Everybody will figure, you know, no mystery involved anymore with this at all. All right, so they did. They got Clifton Webb. Clifton Webb played it beautifully, got an Oscar nomination, joined 20th Century Fox, became a big movie star. Laird was left holding the bag. Well, they said, we're going to give you something else as a compensation. A couple of years before, before Laird got kind of hung up about playing too many villains, he had persuaded the studio to buy a book called Hangover Square. It was a contemporary story by Patrick Hamilton, who had written Gaslight. And the story was about a man who had dead moods. And during one of these dead moods, he kills an actress. He drowns her in her bathtub, right? And she deserves it. 
But uh, so he's, a, he's a basically a sympathetic character, and it's a very subtle movie. Well, after The Lodger, you can kind of look at this poster and see what 20th Century Fox did with, with Hangover Square as far as revamping it. They set it back to the turn of the century. They made it basically a facsimile of The Lodger. It has the same co-star, George Sanders. It's directed by the same man, John Brom, produced by the same producer, Robert Bassler, written by the same writer, Bar Linden. The only big difference is, instead of Merle Oberon doing the can-can, Linda Dornell does a can-can. Laird looks at the script, sees what they've done, and he says, I won't do it. I refuse to do it. I will not do that picture because of what you've done to the story. I won't go on playing carbon copies of Jack the Ripper for him. All right, I won't do it. I'll take a suspension. He does. He goes on suspension. He stays on suspension for two weeks. Suspension meaning, of course, the studio is not paying him. The studio makes all kinds of threats to him. You better do this picture or this. You better do this picture or that. All right, this sort of thing. He holds out for two weeks. Eventually, however, he gives up. So, all right, all right, I'll do it. But he has a whole different attitude about this movie. Well, he also has decided at this point what we talked about in the beginning. He's decided he is going to go stay on this diet that he's been on during this time. He's going to go down to 500 calories. He's going to have plastic surgery. He's going to change the way he looks. He's going to be a totally different man. He tells George Sanders this on the first day of shooting. As George Sanders later puts it, a tragic resolve was born in Laird's mind to become a beautiful man who would never again be cast as a fiend. And he was absolutely hell-bent on making that happen. Hangover Square became what everybody considered to be the most troubled production at 20th Century Fox in 1944. And a large part of the problem, unfortunately, was Laird. He was very temperamental, very short-tempered. He'd always been charming on the sets before, but now he was, uh, he was a terror. Right? He fought with John Brahm about everything. He was just completely losing it because in addition to the dieting, he was taking pills, dangerous drugs that would accelerate his weight loss, and he was basically a walking nervous breakdown. Additionally, he had trouble with his lines, which had never happened before. He was going to have trouble with his lines because he was becoming a very sick man. Uh, his body was basically getting out of control with him because of what he was doing. In the early part of this picture, uh, he has a scene with Alan Napier, whom we all, of course, know and love for playing Alfred in the Batman TV series. Uh, Alan Napier is playing a, a musical maestro, and he says to Larry, he's a musician, a composer, I, I want to uh, conduct your new concerto and uh, present it to the public. And Laird was supposed to say three words. I'm enormously complimented. He couldn't remember them. First take, Napier gives him the cue, doesn't know the line. Ten takes, Laird can't remember, I'm enormously complimented. If I get to the 11th take, and instead of Laird saying, I'm enormously complimented, he does come out with the line, but instead of saying, I'm enormously complimented, he says, I'm enormously complicated, which God knows is the truth, right? And everybody on the set just falls on the floor left, all right, because they know he is enormously complicated. But the producer comes down, so they hear we're having problems, we're having trouble with Mr. Krugar, and he calls lunch early, and they take him off to compose himself uh, and to cool down, because the heat on the set at this point is 104 degrees. It, it looks, things look really bad. Linda Darnell, as we said, plays the uh, vixen in this movie, the villainess, the femme fatale. And uh, she is really, really fine. Uh, very, very lovely and, and very fatal. Uh, it, I always laugh. There, uh, Time Magazine, when it reviewed the film, ran a picture of Linda Darnell and said that she, uh, Linda Darnell has become Hollywood's most rousing portrayer of unhoused broken sex. <laughs> now, I, I, I want to pursue that a little bit. Um, Father Mike. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, how many people come to confession to you and say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Last weekend I had unhoused broken sex. You, you get that a lot? Uh, you still don't confess, I cannot say. You cannot say. But one is four. Right. Yeah. Can I imagine the penance you give them? Yeah. 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 But uh, she's very good. Well, Laird was just in awe of Linda Darnell. Uh, he just thought she was the most beautiful woman. And, and, and Bessie had said that you know years before when she was out there, whenever Linda Donnell was around, Laird could barely talk. He just was just in awe of her beauty. 
Well, there's a scene in this film in which Larry strangles Linda Darnell. Then he takes her body, dresses it up as a dummy, and burns it on the Guy Fawkes bonfire. Right? It's a great horror centerpiece in the movie. Well, during production, Larry suddenly says, I'm not going to strangle her in the movie. Uh, you, you can have her strangled and say that I did it, but I, I don't want to play the scene. Right? I, I don't want to be seen on screen strangling Linda Darnell. I won't do it. And of course, you know, the studio says, well, you, you damn well will do it, all right? You're going to do it. So of course, he eventually did it, very, very upset. Comes in, plays the scene, strangles Linda Darnell while she's primping in her mirror. Picks up her body to carry her out. And as he's awkwardly leaving the room, trying to carry her body through there, he bangs Linda Darnell's head against the door frame and knocks her out. Linda Darnell's sister told me some years ago, she said that Linda Darnell used to tell the story that when she regained consciousness a few minutes later, uh, the first thing she saw was Laird kneeling beside her. And it was horrified look on his face. He said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I, 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 well, can you ever forgive me? I'm so terribly sorry. And she said, really, it's, it's fine. I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. And he go oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I, I can't believe I did that, I'm so sorry too. And she said, he carried on so much that Linda Darnell started to laugh and Larry started to cry. He just was, you know, he began to cry. And uh, she said, no, no, it really, it's, it's all right, it's all right. You see, he brought her flowers and, you know, very meekly apologized and was, was terribly sorry for what he did. And of course, she was very gracious and forgiving. Well, unfortunately, things only got worse on Hangover Square. Everything seemed to be going wrong. Meanwhile, he's fighting like crazy right at the studio, trying to get his release. And the studio starts doing a really reprehensible thing, as we mentioned in the beginning. They start leaking these rumors about his personal life, all right, which are designed to humiliate him and are designed to upset him, which certainly are doing their job because they're showing, you want to be tough with us, you know, we can be tough with you. And all these horrible rumors are leaking, and I won't go into them, but they are, of course, in the book that I'm selling at my table about him. And uh, it, it, was, it was a very, very sad thing. And he's really, you know, he's, he's losing it by the day. Other bad things are happening for him at this point. He was, earlier in the year, actually engaged to a young lady, but she left him. Then he had another lover. He went to a party in Hollywood, and at one point his lover got angry at him and called him a fat pig. He said, if you don't lose more weight, I'm going to leave you. Humiliated him in front of everybody. Nothing was going right. Everything was falling apart. And he's extremely upset. However, he's a little, he's, for all the rash flamboyance and the dressing up and the humor and everything, He's too shy and sensitive a man really to fight back against the studio the way he really should fight back. I mean, he's, he's basically a professional and, and this sort of thing, and he figures he's going to do the right thing, even though he's very angry, he'll somehow see it through. George Sanders was not quite the same way. George Sanders is a good friend of Laird, and he knows what Laird's going through on this film, and he knows what the studio is doing to Laird on this film. And George really doesn't need too much provocation to be difficult. <laughs> he kind of enjoys it, all right? He really loves putting these people in their place. And um, an unusual thing happens. They're filming the last scene of the movie. The movie's shot out of sequence. But they're shooting the last scene. What's going to be the last scene of the movie, all right? And that is that Laird is in, as the composer's in this house, and he's playing the last chords of the piano concerto, and the place is burning down around him. And um, you can hear the music from the street. And George Sanders rescues Faye Marlowe, the good girl, and runs her out to her father, who's played by Alan Napier. And Alan Napier is supposed to look at George and indicate the music being played inside. And he's supposed to say, listen, why didn't he try to get out? And George Sanders originally had a line, something along the, the lines of, because he knew that although he was to die, his music would live forever. Pretty lame line, but you know, that was probably the end of the movie. Well, they set up this scene on the back lot to shoot it. They have to set the house on fire. It's supposed to be a blizzard, so they have snow. They have wind machines to blow the snow around. They have a fire department there to put out the fire. Everything has to go like clockwork because this is a, this is a dangerous scene to shoot, right? They have a rehearsal. John Brom sets it up. Okay, run out. George, they Marlowe run out. Alan Napier meets him. Alan Napier says, listen, why didn't he try to get out? And Sanders turns to John Brom and says, oh, by the way, John, that line I have about 
is music living forever? That's a bloody awful line, and I'm not going to say it. And John says, well, you have to say it, George, because it's the last line in the movie. Well, it's an awful line, stupid line, it's beneath me, not going to say it. John said, you know, you'll be all right, George, you'll, you'll find it. Set the house on fire, put the wind machines on, throw the snow out, action. George runs after the girl, Alan Napier's there. Alan Napier says, listen, why didn't he try to get out? George stands there, the silence. Sound man suddenly comes over the microphone. I didn't hear Mr. Sanders' line. Sanders says, that's because I didn't say the line, you silly ass. And I told you, I'm not going to say that line. <laughs> it's a bloody awful line, it's beneath me, and I'm not going to say it. John Brown looks at him and says, you wouldn't dare do that again. Get it again. Of course, meanwhile, the fire department has to put the house out and everything in there. They gotta get it all set up again. They set the house on fire again. They turn the wind machines on. They blow the snow all around. They all come running out. Alan Napier says, listen, why didn't he try to get out? <laughs> Silence. Cut! Sound, I didn't hear Mr. Sanders' line. I'm not saying the line, you fool. I'm not saying it's an awful line. Alan Napier said, I don't know how often we shot the scene that night. The director figuring George would eventually say the line, George wouldn't say a damn thing. Gets to be after midnight, there's not much house left to burn, right? <laughs> not much snow left to blow around. George goes over and sits in his chair, gets somebody, sends somebody gave him a blanket. And they bring George the blanket, George puts the blanket up around him, puts it back, goes to sleep. John Brom calls the producer, Robert Bassett, who says, we got a problem, Sanders won't say his line. Did you get him? No, I can't get him to say his line. You've got to get over here and get him to say his line. So, of course, the whole company's waiting, including the fire department. So, Robert Bassler comes over. It's like 2 o'clock in the morning. It's cold. Bassler comes through the streets, goes up. Where is he? Where is he? Where is Sanders? Over there. There's George in his chair, comfortable, his blanket around him, and head back. Robert Bassler walks up to him and says, How dare you? You arrogant SOB. Except he doesn't say SOB. Sanders doesn't even get out of his chair. His right arm comes up from under the blanket and goes, <laughs> hits Bassler in the face, breaks his glasses, and knocks him out. George gets up and says, Good night. <laughs> The next day, the executives at Fox arrange lunch for Sanders and Bassler for an apology to take place. And they sit down, and the executive says, all right, gentlemen, uh, here we are. I believe an apology is in order. George Minnie says, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, there, there certainly is uh, an apology in order. Uh, last evening, Mr. Bassler referred to me as an SOB. In doing that, he insulted my mother. When Mr. Bassler apologizes for having insulted my mother, I'll consider coming back and doing the scene again if you give me a different line. So, at that point, Bassler said, oh, all right, fine, just get the scene done. Yeah, okay, we'll write you a new line. They came back, fire department comes back, set the house on fire, a little bit again. All right, George comes running out. Alan Napier says, listen, why didn't he try to get out? And if you watch the movie, what George Sanders says, the revised line, he simply says, it's better this way, sir. That was acceptable to him, and that was the line that was recorded, and that's the last line in the movie. So George enjoyed doing this, and you, but I have, I'd like to think that a lot of this rebellion was done because he knew how the studio was really nailing Krugar, and he wanted to get a little revenge on Laird's part. The film ends, there's some retakes. Laird decides that he's going to go into the hospital, He's going to have some operations, and the first one he's going to have is to correct a hernia. He's going to have a stomach operation to correct a hernia. At this point, he is a wreck, all right, from all the, from what he's put himself through with this ordeal. In December, he goes in, actually in late November, he goes into the hospital. On December the 4th, they do the stomach operation. On December the 9th, 4 o'clock in the morning, Larry Prigar has a heart attack. They call his mother. 
his aunt. They come to the hospital, of course. They think he's rallying because after all, he's still a young man, should have maybe survived a heart attack. But at noon, he has a second heart attack. And the death watch begins. And at 4.52 p.m. on the night of December the 9th, Larry Brigard dies, and he's only 31 years old, as we noted. The funeral takes place at Forest Lawn in the burial. It was a private funeral, uh, and the eulogist at the funeral was, interestingly enough, Vincent Price. It was asked by Laird's mother to deliver the eulogy. And of course, Price was a very, very eloquent man. I'm sure he gave a beautiful eulogy, uh, but uh, I don't, I've never been able to find it. I get the impression he must have given it probably to the family right afterwards, and the newspapers weren't there to report it. So we don't know what he said. But George Sanders later put it very well. He said, Larry Krigar was an actor of great talent who was virtually assassinated by Hollywood. Well, we have one little follow-up to this story, personal story, and that's this. I have a lot of people I consider my very favorite actors. Larry Krigar is one of them, and he has been since I was seven years old. And my dad and I saw the last 15 minutes of The Lodger on television, and I remember seeing Laird rampaging through the theater. I said to my father, as I always do when we saw the movies, who's that actor? He said, that's Larry Krigar. And I always said the same question, is he still alive? And of course, lots of people we saw in shock theater weren't still alive. Is he still alive? And I said, no, no, he, he died a long time ago. I became very interested in Krigar, and a very strange thing happened. At significant times in my life, his movies would appear on television. And he only made 16 movies, so it was kind of out odd that a Larry Krigar movie would come on. I remember that when I graduated from high school that week, uh, the night before graduation, one of his films came on television. I remember that uh, the week before I was married, one of his films came on television. Uh, this sort of thing it kept cropping up. And then when I was 22, I decided to write an article about Larry Krigar, as much as I could find at the time. And Leonard Malton, yeah. Yeah. great Leonard Malton, all right, Leonard Martin. I sent the article to Leonard Martin, who at that point published the magazine Film Band Monthly. All right, Leonard Martin ran the article. On the basis of that article, I got paid work for writing, and so I kind of felt like, in a way, I owed my career to my interest in Laird Krigar. Whenever he would be on television or something, I used to always say to Barbara, Laird Krigar, you know, he's with me always. And it was the boy, he's with me always. That's my boy, Laird Krigar. Well, in 1981, we decided to go to California on a research trip. I said to Barbara, I said, you know what I think I might do? I'd like to contact Forrest Vaughn and ask where Larry Krigar is buried. So that when we go out there, we can pay our respects. Today, you know, you'd go on the internet to find a grave and they would give all the information. Of course, as many years ago, they didn't, they didn't have that. So I wrote to Forrest Vaughn and the vice president answered my letter and he sent me a map and he said, yes, Mr. Krigar is interred in the eventide section and this is basically where he is. And he drew a little circle around the area on the map where approximately where the grave was. And he says, you know, when you're out here, you feel free to visit. So we went out to California. While we were there, this one particular day of the week, we had something planned in the afternoon, and it fell through. It was, it was, it was a postponed the next day. We had the afternoon free. Barbara said, well, do you want to go to Forest Lawn? And like you said, see Larry Krigar's grave. Pay your respects. And I said, yeah. I said, wait a minute, I don't think so. Today's December the 9th, and he died on December the 9th. And I don't know, I, even though it was 37 years ago that he died, I, I might be intruding. I mean, he might have family there, or friends or something might be there on December the 9th. And so I don't know if we should go, but anyway, we decided we go anyway. If you're all familiar with Los Angeles, you know that if you are driving on Sunset Boulevard, which is what we were doing, heading from where we were in Brentwood towards Glendale, if you get on Sunset Boulevard, it is east-west, right? Very hard to get lost on Sunset Boulevard. We got lost. Right? Ended up in the hills, riding around the hills, finally got back down on the Sunset Boulevard. Went over to Glendale Boulevard, north-south, all right? Fairly easy, hard to get lost. We got lost again. Ended up in the wrong lane, off in the hills on Glendale Boulevard. Up in the hills, came back down, got on Glendale Boulevard. Eventually, we finally found our way to Forest Lawn. At that point, though, it was kind of late in the day. There's Forest Lawn. It's got to be reverently known by a lot, to a lot of people as the Disneyland of cemeteries. Actually, it's really pretty nice. It's really, really quite a lovely place. When we got there, it's, it's enormous. I mean, huge, huge cemetery. When we got there, 
there didn't seem to be another soul in the entire place except for the lady at the booth. So we got to the lady at the booth. I showed her my map and my letter from the vice president. She said, oh, yes, we'll even tied us up this road and you're going. We drove up. I said, hey, how about that? You know, we're actually here. We're going to get out. I'm going to pay our respects to Larry Krieger and his grave. So we got out of the car, started to walk over to find it, and the water sprinkling machines came on. <laughs> and there was water everywhere. I mean, it was going up and down, and east, west, north, south, every, water everywhere. And, you know, for a while we bravely just kind of persevered. We were young and crazy looking. But then we were starting to get really wet. And I would have to get back in the car to just stop. They didn't stop. All right? I mean, it kept on shooting. They were ready to go for who knows how long. So we sat in the car, and of course, again, it's getting later and later in the day. I said, we're going to have to go down and tell the lady at the booth the water sprinkling's on and, you know, that we can't get out of the car. So I went down and told her, and oh, so, I'm so terribly sorry, so terribly sorry. I'll have a maintenance man come there, and he'll turn off the sprinkling system. So we went back up the hill, up to Eventide, sat there in the car. A few minutes later, sure enough, a pickup truck comes riding down the hill. Guy jumps out, runs up to a tree, sticks his hand up into the tree, goes like this, and the sprinkling stops, all right? They have the plumbing hidden, obviously, around him. Around the place. He turns off the sprinkling machine. We get out and we go right to him. We say, Look, um, you know, maybe you can help us. We have this map here and we're looking for the grave of this person right around here. And he says, Okay, what's his name? And we said, His name was Larry Krigar. And of course, he had never heard of him. And uh, he said, Oh, I don't know. It sounds familiar to me. And uh, we looked, he helped us look around for a while. He couldn't find it either. And of course, the hill is loaded with hundreds, if not thousands, of graves, all of which are just small headstones. All right, nothing more name, just all these heads just all over the hill, some data on it. So we're standing up there, and it's getting later and later. They're going to clock the gates at five. And it's December, so it's twilight. It's, you know, it's starting to get dark. And, you know, we're standing up on the hill at Forest Lawn, looking out at the lights down in Los Angeles coming up at night. And, gee, we came all the way here. We're not going to find it. Start looking down one row. Barbara's in another row. Barbara says, wait a minute, wait a minute, Greg, I found it. I found it. So, walk up to the grave. I looked down, and the first thing I noticed, to tell you the truth, was that they had his birth date wrong. He was born in 1913, which I knew for a fact from having his birth certificate and this sort of thing. And they had 1914 on the grave marker. That was very strange. While I was looking at this, suddenly, now I'm not the sort of person who says, I heard a voice, and something spoke to me. I know this before. But I actually did hear a voice. Some voice. The only voice says to me, look at your watch. Look at your watch. My watch. And it was 4.52 p.m. And I looked at Barbara and I said, it's 4.52 p.m. He died at 4.52 p.m. on December the 9th. And that's the precise moment we're standing at his gravestone. That's why we got lost on Sunset Boulevard. That's why we got lost on Glendale Boulevard. That's why the sprinkling system was on when we came up here. He's playing a trick on us, all right? Uh, he wants me to be here at this precise moment to freak me out. Because after all, he's with me always, right? He's pulling a stunt. Barbara says, Greg, Read the inscription on the marker. Hey, I'm going to cut in here because this was a presentation with slides and things being projected behind Mr. Meg while he was giving the presentation about Laird Krigar. And he didn't read what was on the tombstone, so I thought I'd share it with you here. The tombstone actually says, I am with you always. A little chilling in a very cool way. All right, back to Greg. This was a message from the beyond, and he had really gotten me. And so I stood up there in Forest Lawn, almost in darkness at this point, and had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> we eventually left, once Barbara got me collected, all right, to leave. We eventually left, and it wasn't over. We then decided to go to a Mexican restaurant and drink margaritas all night to get over this. We were heading to the Mexican restaurant, and we got, again, we got diverted, we got stuck in traffic, and we got stuck at this one spot. And we were next to this real big building. And um, we were there for like 20 minutes, you know, while they were trying to clear traffic out. Barbara was driving, she just turns to me, she says, you know, well, we've been here a long time. By the way, what is that big building over there that we're, you know, stuck next to? I'll go over and see it. 
It's Good Samaritan Hospital, which is where he died. So he strikes again, right? Well, we went back another time, and I thought, we're going to go in the morning when it's sunny, and, every, and you know, he's not going to keep, this time he'll, he won't play any jokes or tricks or anything, all right, we'll just, we'll just go. And uh, so we go, and um, I audaciously sit down, you know, right down there by the grave, and pose by it for a picture, and think, okay, nothing unusual happened, you know, everything's fine, we, we, you know, we got here, nothing. we get home and we look at the pictures, look at that white light coming up, like out of the marker. That's the only evidence of that white light in any of the like 200 pictures we took the entire trip. That's the only one that had that shaft of light. So I said, damn it, he did it again. <laughs> All right? He did it again. Well, at any rate, I do like to think uh, that he is with me always, and uh, I'd like to think that he was with me during this talk today. So uh, if you can, stick around and watch The Lodger. God bless you, Laird. You were a great actor and a great guy. Barbara, I love you. Thank you very much. It has been written since the beginning of time that evil supernatural creatures exist in a world of darkness. And it is also said Man can call forth these powers of darkness, the demons of hell. It is the night of the demon. And tonight is the night that Dana Andrews, as a daring scientist, defies the mysterious murderous devil cult in a desperate battle against the demons of hell. Oh, why did you drop the poker? Red hot. You didn't you know? Oh, my boy, you're as pale as death. There was something in here. He has been chosen. I've been chosen for what? What do you mean? Today I found all the pages of my desk calendar torn out after October the 22nd. I know why. He died on the 22nd. John, what's the matter? The same thing happened to my desk calendar after the 28th. The frightened girl. The master of witchcraft. You will die, as I said, at 10 o'clock on the 28th of this month. Your time allowed is just three days from now. Skeptical? Don't make up your mind till you see this masterpiece of macabre magic. Because, after all, evil supernatural creatures really do exist. Dr. Jekyll, yearning for love and discovering on the eve of her marriage the monstrous inheritance that was her birthright of fear. Oh, I still shudder when I recall that face, like some perverted mask of evil out of a legend of horror. Then, then you saw him as Hyde? Once, at the very last, just before the mob caught him. They almost tore him to pieces. The villagers broke into this tomb and drove a stake through his heart. Daughter of Dr. Jekyll, terrified that she become the disfigured thing that was her father, a vampire drawing sustenance from bestiality. I've got to get a stake and drive it through my heart and bury me beside my father. Well, do it! Do I have to kill myself? If you love me, please kill me!
That brings us to the end of the show. Make sure you go to monsterkidradio.net to follow up on everything that you've heard about in this episode. Links to the band, links to Gregory William Makes Books on Amazon, links to, well, pretty much everything that we've talked about here on the show. Our website is where you're going to want to go. You can also find our contact information over there. Our email address is monsterkidradio at gmail.com. And our voicemail line is area code 503-479-5657. That's 503-4795-MKR. Now, I do have a voicemail or two there. I just haven't processed them and played them here on the show. But do know that I have the voicemails. I will be getting through them, including the entries to the contest that we were running. And go back and listen to previous episodes to know what we were talking about there. That contest is done. The deadline has come and gone. But uh, those of you who have participated, stay tuned. You'll hear those voicemails in an upcoming episode. Also, speaking of previous episodes, Kenny mentioned an episode of Monster Kid Radio in which Stephen D. Sullivan and I talked about the movie The Mummy, the original Mummy with Boris Karloff back in episode 261. You know, for fun, I put a link to that episode in the show notes as well. You know, we've got a Facebook page, a Facebook group, a Twitter, a YouTube. Links to all of this can be found on the website. And at the top of the show, I mentioned Twitch. So we've been trying to come up with an alternative to Rabbit TV since Rabbit TV is pretty much gone at this point. If it is it maybe just barely hanging on, but it's not going to be reliable for the Monster Kid Radio Halloween Virtual Crash, the Halloween movie watch along marathon. I wanted to have a site that would allow us to uh, stream movies and chat during Halloween because Halloween day, I'm doing nothing but playing monster movies all bloody day. Just needed to find a place to do it, and I think I think Twitch might be the way to go. And, you know, I've been kind of thinking about creating a Twitch TV channel thing for Monster Kid Radio anyway, so this just might be the kick in the monster pants I need to actually finally make that happen. The one downside, the one downside is that uh, Twitch does seem to run ads occasionally, but that just might be one of those things that we have to deal with as we watch all these movies together on Halloween. So if you have a Twitch account or don't, head over to twitch.tv, create an account or log into your account and just look up Monster Kid Radio. That's the username that I'm using over there. It's all one word, all lowercase. It's not going to have anything playing normally. I might have something going through it as kind of like a test, but yeah, just go ahead and subscribe or do whatever it is you do on Twitch to make sure that when Halloween rolls around, well, you're good to go to watch a bunch of movies. I haven't decided what movies we're going to watch yet. That's still something we're working on. So if you have any suggestions or recommendations, requests for what movies we might play during the Monster Movie Marathon Watch Along, well, get a hold of me. Back up about a minute or two to hear about the contact information or go to the website. I'm going to wrap up. I need to turn the air conditioner back on. So uh, let me leave you with this. Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0 unported license. Now, of course, that doesn't apply to Professor Frenzy's bedtime story. That is copyright Jerry Green and the song Operation Neptune from the album Operation Neptune from the band The Catatonics. That belongs to them. They gave us permission to play it here on the show. You're going to hear it again here in a second. Pay attention to our YouTube channel for an upcoming video announcing what's coming up next month on the show. My name is Derek M. Cook. Talk to everybody next week. Ciao. Ciao.